Welcome today to the Smith Memorial Boxing Ring. There you can see my grandmother and mighty Mike Lackis there below. Easy to tell which is which. I'll put some more pictures of my relatives up here tonight. You can probably see there's grandpa over there in the corner and there's grandma again. And we've got a good crowd with us and our third man in the ring tonight. What's the name, sorry? Jason. Jason, Holden. welcome. All right, brother, I'm going to pass to you. I think that's on Zoom out. Yep. And, uh, Sergeant, I don't... We've got 20 seconds. We're off. Take the glasses off.
Yeah.
Ten seconds. <laughs> Ten seconds. Five seconds. Ah. <laughs> yeah, go on, Ryan. Have a crack. Put the gloves on. No, come on. Come on. Have a go. It's only... It's good. Come on. Give the gloves to him. Give the gloves to him. Go. Put them on. Put them on. Yeah. That's it. You're the man. Mate, after that was one of the toughest fights I've ever had for a long while. She got the answer right and put the joy in my seat in the first round. The jury made three trunks. After that, I can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was saying, boxing is a two-stage question to be. What way away is very, very close? You were saying, I'm a customer, mate. You can't pick that person up. Oh, I'm not going to go around with me. So you're close. You can't hear you from yourself. Yeah, you're looking at the top. So it's a safe way to do it. Nice and Come on, Ryan. That's a, this is where it's okay.
Come on, Ryan, move around. Move around. <laughs> Don't turn your back on him. Hey? Jesus, get in there. Get in on it. Come on. Bam! Ha ha. Ha ha. Ha ha. Ha ha. Ha ha. Yeah, come on, just learn. Learn, learn, learn from the experience. I don't normally do this, the uh, psalm reading, but today being the Good Shepherding Sunday, I'm going to suggest we do do the psalm reading. And I'm going to suggest Mike and I will read the 23rd psalm together. And if you know it, say it with us. I know different translations of the 23rd psalm. I mean, I love the traditional one. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But uh, this one, the Lord is my shepherd, therefore can I lack nothing. Um, we, we will stick with that one. But uh, say it along if you remember it. You got it, Mike? The Lord is my shepherd, shepherd therefore, therefore can, can I lack nothing. nothing. He will make me lie down in green pastures and lead me beside still waters. He will refresh my soul and guide me in right pathways for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff comfort me. You spread a table before me in the face of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil and my cup will be full. Surely your goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Glory to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as in the beginning, so now, and forever. Amen. 23rd Psalm is one that probably we're all familiar with, certainly in, in the um, Hebrew-Jewish tradition as well as in the Christian tradition. I su suspect that it's well known in the Islamic tradition as well. I don't know how much this psalm's embraced in the Muslim community, but it's certainly been a favourite across um, the other Abrahamic religions. Um, why do you think it's so popular? Um, just because of the, like, you know, the cliche, cliche meaning behind, I will fear no evil for you are with me. You know, the, the, the Lord is with me, so. Yeah. 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 I, I, mean, I, I, think I agree. I think that's the key concept is of the Lord being with us. Um, I think the greatest curse in life is being alone. And uh, the idea here is that you're never alone. God's always with us. Um, yeah, what's the greatest torture, you know, people can give is putting people in isolation. You know, I think of my friend Morty Vanunu who spent 11 and a half years in solitary confinement, being alone. Uh, it's one of the... Uh, the first diagnosis of the human condition uh, given in the Bible it is not good that man should be alone. 
and it's not good that we should be alone. And we often are alone, feeling alone. And the great reminder of the psalm is that we're never truly alone. The Lord is always with us, following us. Interesting that the actual Hebrew word uh, for following, it's, it's, it's good, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Um, the idea of follow, it's not like it's just sort of dragging along behind you. The actual Hebrew word means to pursue, like to actively, to stalk almost. So it's like you're being stalked by uh, goodness and mercy. It's like just when you think things are falling apart, you, goodness and mercy jump out at you from behind a corner. Um, it's a beautiful concept, really, and it, it's true to life as well, isn't it? Just when we think things have fallen apart and there's no one there for us, all of a sudden the Lord is with us and uh, we find ourselves jumped by goodness and mercy. I mean, this is um, always a favourite psalm for for funerals and uh, when in the bedside of people in hospital, you know, we read the 23rd Psalm, again, a reminder of the presence of God with us. I, I did uh, hear of one occasion where someone requested it for their wedding as well, which uh, I don't think the priest was a little surprised, but they said, well, you know, look, you know, a parent's marriage has failed and, you know, we need to... We need the presence of the Lord with us when we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, you know. And it's a good um, realistic outlook on relationships. <laughs> but uh, needing God with us all the time and being jumped every now and then by goodness and mercy, great concept. Well, have our other readings. Did you want to read one of them, Mike, or shall I read them? I can read one. Okay, do you want to give us the um, uh, reading from uh, Acts? So it's Acts 5, sorry, Acts 4, 5 to 12. You find it there. <laughs> While Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple, and the source, Sadducees, came to them, much annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming that in Jesus there is a resurrection of the dead. They arrested, they, uh, they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and they numbered about 5,000. The next day their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, Caphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the highest priestly family. When they had, had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, By what power of, by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rules of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who is sick and, uh, and are asked to know this man has to be healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised dead. This is Jesus. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is no salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Keep reading. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Okay, this is the stories of the very much the beginning of the early church, aren't they? And what strikes me right away when we hear the uh, this story from Acts is that it feels like we've been here before. It's it's just like it was with Jesus. We're told the next day the rulers, the elders, the scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, 
Remember last time that happened? That was Jesus on trial. You know, they were all there, and um, Caiaphas and Annas were there as well, putting Jesus on trial. Now they're putting um, Peter and John on trial. And uh, why? Well, roughly the same issues. Uh, if, you, if you go back in um, Acts chapter 3, it's, it's, uh, there's the healing of the man, the, the lame man. This is the context in which it all takes place. So um, if you remember, they're in the temple and uh, the lame man is begging. And that's when Peter and John say, look, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. Sorry, that's the way it was worded in the old Sunday school song we used to sing. In the name of Jesus Christ, and others rise up and walk. So the the um, parallels are extraordinary. I mean, that's exactly what Jesus used to do: rise up and walk. He, Jesus would say to people, and they would rise up and walk. And now Peter and John are doing exactly the same thing. And just as Jesus was arrested and put on trial, it, it's all happening again. So it's a reminder that the path that that Jesus treads is one that the disciples tread too after him indeed the uh, as the early church moves into action the it seems to be moving along parallel tracks completely it seems to be the same story and uh, indeed um, peter and john here have just spent a night in prison so um yeah the parallels are great and it's it's a reminder too that um you know, there's a wonderful miracle. This man who's 40 plus years old, we're told, who's now walking, never been able to walk. Um, wonderful miracle. At the same time, the Peter and John just spent the night in jail. Why didn't they get a miracle and stay out of jail? <laughs> you know, um, why is it always that wonderful things happen alongside pain? Why is it always that way? I mean, this is the case for Jesus as well, of course, the wonderful miracles, and yet the cross, yet the persecution. Um, and that's reflected in what Peter says at, at the end of that passage too, when he, he tells them it's the very, uh, quoting the Psalms. It's great, I think, that the New Testament apostles never felt they could tell the story of Jesus without referring back to the Hebrew Bible and to the Psalms most especially, the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, has become the cornerstone. In other words, Jesus, who was not the Messiah people were waiting for, not the, uh, didn't appear like, like the king of the world, the, the very stone that the builders rejected seemed, seemed useless. It was actually the key. Uh, the key thing. We'll have a second reading, which is from uh, 1 John 3, 16 to 24. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has this world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts. He knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit that he has given us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, it's uh, just we saw in the Acts reading sort of what Jesus did in miracles. So the disciples after him continued to perform miracles. Even more centrally, I think, the um, 
testimony from the Apostle John, just as Jesus loved, uh, so we have to love. Uh, there's, uh, uh, we're all familiar with John 3.16, for God so loved the world, you know, that he gave his only son. And here we've got one John 3.16, which is, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay, lay down our lives for one another. So we've got the John 3.16 about God's love for the world and 1 John 3.16 about our love for one another based on God's love to the world. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, verse. Uh, and again, it shows as Jesus did. So the disciples are expected to do and will do. And uh, it's a good reminder, I think, from, from uh, John that love the love of the Jesus shows is not um, just pure emotion. It's not just um, feeling good about someone. It's it's concrete, laying down your life. And so we should lay down our lives for one another. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean we have to look for a, an occasion to get ourselves killed for a, for. A, those we love, because John straight away spells it out in very practical terms. How does God's love abide in anyone who has this world's good goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? So it's that um, sacrificial love translates very directly into um, just sharing what you've got with other people. Do you have anything you want to add to this passage, Mike? We'll stand for the gospel. Well, the gospel is written in the tenth chapter. The gospel coins in John, beginning the eleventh verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I'm the good shepherd says the Lord. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. It's again our central image of Jesus, the Good Shepherd, so very much taking up the theme of Psalm 23. I am the Good Shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. Um, the contrast is, here is with the hired hand who doesn't really care anything for the sheep, is there for the money. When the uh, hired hand comes, the, when the, sorry, when the, when the wolf comes, the hired hand runs, sheep are scattered. I mean, I guess it would be interesting to think who is Jesus contrasting this with religious rulers of his day, we assume. You know, who are the hired hands? Who is in it for the money? There seem to be plenty of people in the religious world today who uh, seem to be in it for the, well, for all the wrong reasons, in it for the money, or, or uh, I don't believe there is much money in, in <laughs> some people seem to do very well out of, out of religion. Um, Jesus is the good shepherd, not in it for the money. Uh, the thing with um, the Good Shepherd too is, is there's a relationship between the shepherd and the sheep. There's intimacy. 
the sheep hear my voice. The sheep hear my voice and they follow me. They won't follow the hired hand. They don't know the voice of the of the, uh, the the person who's in it for the money. They'll recognise ultimately the voice of the, their true shepherd. Any thoughts, Mike? Yeah, the the meaning behind you know they're going to listen to the good shepherd is that you think that's the voice of Jesus Christ. You know they're going to be. You know, I'm asking. You know, do you think they're going to listen to the good shepherd? You know, the the warmth of God. They're going to. It's going to always be with them. You know, hence the metaphor. It's the shepherd. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's easy because, you know, I've hardly ever seen a sheep, let alone, you know, I don't have sheep. So, you know, the, the uh, rural imagery is somewhat lost on us. I think the closest we have is like without pets or something. If you've got a dog and, you know, it hears your voice, even my bunny rabbit, 